ends with that line, tell the world of the treasure you found. And, you know, God always leaves himself a witness. I don't know if you're aware of this. And the darker the days, the brighter the witness can be. And when times get tough, that's where the witnesses really stand out because there's such a distinct difference between what the rest of the world is doing and what the ungodly are doing and what the righteous do. And you know, I, I know that you've watched over the last few days, last few weeks, last few months as uh, <clears throat> displays of, of, uh, of righteousness and unrighteousness, of uh, truthfulness and deceit and all of these things have begun to manifest themselves in some really powerful ways, you know, and, and, and movements and so forth. And I'm just telling you that what you're seeing are the four glimmerings of a kind of, of, kind of earth that is so lawless and so uh, anarchy bound and so world uh, globalism dominated with thought that it's going to be possible for a, someone, a person, to come in and dominate the entire world and, and basically lead the world uh, for a period of time and become Satan's man on this earth, Satan's Messiah, as Jesus Christ is God's Messiah and our Messiah, our Savior. Satan has a counterfeit for everything God has. And even though in the book of Revelation, you know, that he'll be called the beast, he's called the beast a lot of times instead of the word antichrist, he's called the beast. So when you see the word beast in Revelation, it, it, you just can put a parenthesis and say antichrist. And the antichrist in Revelation, it says that uh, he who was, uh, he who is and who was not and yet is. In other words, Jesus is he who was who is, and who is to come. Revelation, by the fourth verse in the first chapter, said I'm, this message is from he who was, and he who is, and he who is to come. And then the beast is the one who was, and the one who is not, and yet is. <laughs> a, phony little, a phony little imitation of the real thing is what he is. And uh, Anyway, I just thought that it might be kind of interesting to know what happens to him. One of the big questions I know we all have in life is, if God's so much stronger than the devil, and he is, I mean, the devil is not a, really a decent adversary for God, actually. Because, I mean, in order to be an adversary, that you, there has, you have to be equal in some way. And the devil, is, thank you, Isaac, and the devil is no way equal to God. Because he's not omnipresent, God is. The devil can't be everywhere at one time. He's not omnipotent, which means all-powerful, all-potent. Uh, the devil can't do anything he wants to do. He can only do what God lets him do. Read the book of Job. Yeah. Yeah. If he could, you wouldn't be here. That's, I can tell you that. If he could do anything he wanted to do and the Holy Spirit did not surround you with ministers that have been sent from the realms of God to guard you and protect you and minister what the Bible says to the heirs of salvation, who are the heirs of salvation? Well, anyone that's opened their heart and let Jesus Christ come on the inside. We are the heirs of salvation and we are protected, the Bible says, by ministering angels and the power of the Holy Spirit. So the devil can't do to us what he wants to do to us. And, he, and he's not omniscient either, which means he doesn't know everything. God knows everything. God knows what you're thinking right now. Is that kind of a scary thought? God knows what you thought when you came in today. He knows what you said last night and who you said it to and what you meant by it. He knows all the activity of yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the month before that. He knows from whence you have come and of where you're going. He has foreknowledge of everything that has happened in your life and everything that will ever happen in your life. The devil knows none of that. The only thing he knows is uh, what he can surmise out of what you've done, what are your weaknesses, how can he tempt you in that way, what kind of opportunities he, can he put in your path to give you a chance to mess up with God and choose the wrong thing. I mean, the devil gives you an opportunity to curse yourself. He doesn't have the power to make you do anything. 
He will just offer you opportunities that will entice you. And based on your past failures, he, he takes the path of, of, of most opportunity. In other words, he'll give you choices. He'll, and, and knowing that your weakness is this choice, so he offers this choice. And you're going to have to really resist and, and go with the Spirit of God and pray with for wisdom like the book of James tells you to. Or else you're going to choose that wrong way that he offers you and boom, you're going to curse your own life because God doesn't bless sin and God doesn't reward rebellion. Even though you're living in grace, the fellowship that you have with God is based on uh, behavior. It's based on morality. It's based on character. It's not diversity that makes us strong. I, I, I get so sick of hearing people say that. You hear that all, every politician almost around uses the phrase, diversity is a good thing. Diversity is not a good thing. It has nothing to do with diversity. You take diverse people, I mean, you look at some of the nations of the earth that are just as wicked as demons and poor as dirt and cursed by God, and there are more uh, language groups, more racial groups, more uh, diversity than any place in the world, but yet they don't walk with God and they're cursed. I mean, they have nothing. And then there are places where there's diversity and maybe a little. Diversity is not what makes us strong. Behavior, discipline, morality, yeah, yeah. righteousness is what makes us strong. That's right. I mean, just because we're diverse, we can be diversely wicked. That doesn't give us strength. It's morality and righteousness and goodness and character and kindness that makes us strong. And the devil knows this. And so all the way through the book of Revelation and where we are now and where we're going, I'm going to tell you, and we're going to take a little quick ride through Revelation today. I know you're laughing, but, <laughs> but I know. But I'm going to carry you through these next two chapters. Everybody say two chapters. Uh -huh. I am, man. I'm dedicated. I'm we're fixing to roll now. And the reason I'm doing this is because uh, this, is, this is great drama. It is great information. It is great understanding. And, uh, but I want you to know that all of, this, all of this that I'm about to say and read has to do with what God's going to do on this earth when we're gone, the church is gone, the people of God are gone, there are, there are people that are still being saved on earth, but when they trust Christ, just like you trust Christ, they're not going to get saved another way. They're not, there's only, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I'm the life and no one comes to the Father but by me. So you are not going to come to Christ in another way, whether it's in the tribulation or whether it's right now. You have, there's only one way to be saved. And whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there will be people during the tribulation that will be coming to the Lord because you're going to have two witnesses, and you'll meet these guys in chapter 11. Two witnesses start preaching. These are prophets of God that have been called forth like John the Baptist was in the days of Jesus. You know, John was born six months before Jesus, and John made straight the path of the Lord. And, and you know what John's message was? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And man, the people flooded down to the Jordan River and started getting baptized because they were baptized. They were repenting of their sin. They weren't calling on the name of Christ. They were just repenting of their sin. And John baptized and baptized by until one day there appeared in the line somebody that was different. And, and then he steps down in the water and John recognizes him. And John, John says, why are you here? I need to be baptized of you. You don't need to be baptized of me. And Jesus looked at him and said, so that my father's will might be fulfilled. Carry on, brother. And John baptized Jesus. And when Jesus came up out of the water, and the Holy Spirit in a form of a dove came down and lit on his shoulder, and a voice boomed out of heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I'm going to just remind you, at that point, Jesus had done nothing. Jesus hadn't performed one miracle. He hadn't had one parable. He hadn't led any people anywhere. He didn't proclaim he was a Messiah. I mean, this was, this was before he ever even stepped out on the road to start preaching or doing anything. And yet God says, 
even before Jesus did anything, I am well pleased with you. You don't have to perform to make me well pleased. You don't, ha you don't have to do miracles. You don't have to dance a jig. You don't, you don't have to call down heaven, do miraculous things. I'm already pleased with you. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's going to happen in these next two chapters is, since all of us are gone and the church is gone and people are being saved, and then when they get saved, they're going to become martyrs because the beast hates saved people. I mean, you think the church is being persecuted now, and, you, and it is, and you're going to see it more and more. I hate to tell you this. I hate, I, I'd like to give you some hope. I'd like to tell you that, man, lighter days are coming, and we're going to be looked at in more favorable light. What's happening right now is the, is the world is being shaped to reject the Word of God, all that morality stuff, that fuddy-duddy stuff, that old rules and laws and... I mean, you look at it, everything that is happening in laws, in lawlessness, in anarchy, is taking us away from the things that have made us strong, the anchors of our nation, of our church, of the Bible. And the church is, and the world is being led to walk away from the Bible as some source of truth and stability and look to globalism and world thought and uh, philosophies of man and all of the, and, and, and so there'll be a natural, so, so when we're gone and there's no thorn in the side preaching the gospel every week and nobody's saying, listen to God and you know, turn to God and no neighbor lives next door to you that's saved and knows Christ and so you're never challenged with anything and then the media uh, they just show whatever their prejudices are, and, and then people just listen, and it's, oh, my goodness, uh, let's do this. I mean, listen, now, you know, you know what you need to do? You need to take the Word of God, and you need to look at the Word of God right now today. We got an election coming up in a month. You need to look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God says is right and what's wrong. And look at the people who are represented of what's right and what's wrong. And you need to vote for the one that says, I'm for what's right. Yeah, yeah. I don't care black, white, purple, green, yellow, Democrat, uh, aristocrat, uh, Republican, whatever they might be. You're not, look, you're not black, you're not white, you're not Hispanic. You are a child of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you need to do what is right. And quit attaching yourself to things that are totally opposed to everything you stand for. Regardless of what somebody that's shouting on the mountaintops about, lies and deceit and so forth. Listen to God. But, I mean, it's not going to help anyway, but, I mean, I just, you need, I mean, I mean, it's, it's going downhill fast. I mean, serious. We're, I don't know how close we are to the trump of God sounding, but... But, but you can see the way the world's moving here. I think you can see this. But as long as we're here, I mean, we have our head in the clouds looking for Jesus, but our feet still need to be on the ground. And like the Apostle Paul told uh, the Jews that were, were listening to him preach, in the well, right after the Gospels, he said, um, uh, you are, your, your, your head is in, in, in the future with Jesus but your feet is in Gulfport, Mississippi. <laughs> you, may be, uh, you may be in Christ, but you still love Gulfport. <laughs> so recognize that. So what is our responsibility? Do right as long as you can, as long as you're on this earth. And pray that it'll make a difference and honor God and stand for the word of God and the principles of God and the righteousness of God because this world is being pulled away from that so that in a natural transition, it'll be easy for the beast to claim power and come into control and then dominate this world like the Bible says he will. So we're going to run through chapter 10 and chapter 11, and don't laugh, and I'm going to get it going right, right here. You know, let's, let's, let's just see. I'm, I'm, I'm trying my new toy. Yeah, I mean, we're still working with this, and it's going to be good, hopefully. All right. And, and, and I, this is, you notice the label, second intermission. Let me just explain that really quickly. In the book of Revelation, we have action, 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 action. We come to chapter 6, action, then chapter 7, boom, we got a big parenthesis. Like when you tell stories, and then you 
come to a point in the story and you say, "Uh uh-oh, I need to tell them about this because if I don't tell them about this, the rest of this isn't going to make sense. So he takes a parenthesis in chapter 7 and he tells us how those souls under the altar got there because there were 144,000 Jewish Apostle Pauls called to the ministry. How did they get saved? Well, they listened to two witnesses that God sent at the start of the period of Revelation so now about, you know, a few months or uh, I don't know, it doesn't tell us how long it will be, but a few months, uh, a few, maybe a year or two into the seven-year period that's called tribulation, these 144,000 Apostle Pauls are called and saved because they've been listening to the two witnesses and they give their heart to Christ. And now there's 144,000 people with the seal of God on them that the beast can't touch and can't touch a hair of their head and they can do anything they want to. And the beast has no power over them. And these two witnesses start in chapter 11, and you need to know what they are, who they are, what that's about. So this is the second parenthesis. The first one was chapter 7. The second one is this one, and it lasts about three or four chapters. And so the first thing that happens with this second parenthesis is, let me get this a little bit. I don't have to go backwards. The the second thing that happens is this, this first verse. Let me give you, did you leave a blank, Tanya, there? All right, a strong angel. We're introduced to a strong angel. Let me just go in. I saw, and and I saw still another mighty angel. Everybody say, a a big one. Coming down from heaven. Look at him. Look at what he looked like. Clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. Now, in your notes, I wrote you, you, many scholars, many commentators think this is Jesus himself. And there's only a couple of things wrong with that. It says there comes another angel. And you see, I wrote it in your notes. In the Greek, the word that's translated another means another one just like this one. In other words, the word, there came another angel. It means another angel just like these angels that have been sounding these trumpets, a created being. So that speaks of the fact that this is not Jesus himself. This is an angel, a mighty angel. He's just like the angels that blew the seven trumpets. But buddy, when he comes down, he's got some stuff on him that reminds us of Christ. And it says that he's clothed with a, with a, with a cloud. That's just like, a, just like a, a, in the wilderness. And I don't have time to get into all these details. But it's just like in the wilderness when the cloud followed Israel across the desert. And it was like a giant supernatural canopy. I wrote in your note the word Shekinah. Shekinah means visible. The word Shekinah means visible. So whenever somebody talks about the Shekinah glory, they're talking about the visible glory of God. You can see it. And it was a cloud, and it was over Israel. Why didn't they burn up out in the desert? Because God covered them with a cloud that had supernatural air conditioning in it. And everywhere the cloud went, Israel just stayed in the cloud. And that cloud turned to a pillar of fire at night, and it kept them warm because the deserts get cold at night. So anyway, this angel is clothed with a cloud, just like with a kind of glory. And a rainbow was on his head. You remember what Jesus? You remember the rainbow? The rainbow was given to Noah as a sign that the earth would never be destroyed again by a flood ever. But God, in the midst of this, saying, "Hey, this earth is going to be destroyed. I just want you to know that. But I'm going to still keep my covenant, and we're going to keep water out of all of this." And then on his, uh, 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 rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun. Well, the sun has been, you, you remember when Jesus was walking around on the earth, some of those old Pharisees and Sadducees and mockers and ridiculers, you know what they said to Jesus? If you're the son of God, give us a sign. Dance us a jig. Do a miracle, Jesus. And so he did. When they put him on a cross, at about noon on the day he gave himself up, Six hours of darkness, the sun was blotted out. Give us a sign, Jesus. And so he did. He put the sun out. And now when when, when, when this angel comes back, his face is going to be shining like the sun. But the sun's going to be bright as can be. And his feet like pillars of fire. And pillars of fire always talk about judgment. And it talks about cleansing. It talks about spreading. It talks about, about all of those things where, uh, you know, fire uh, burns and it, and, it, and it spreads and it purifies. And these fiery feet are about to kindle fire like the old world has never seen. This world has insulted God, ridiculed God, mocked God through the millennium. 
They've, uh, they, they, through the generations, they've, they've, they've watched men. He's watched men persecute his people, squander the wealth of this world, abuse his hospitality, disrespect him on his own planet. And now God says, I'm going to send you fiery feet, brother, and they're going to burn and spread. And, and he just wants you to know, buddy, it's, it, it's not going to be pleasant for those who are, who are, who are not with Christ. And so the, that angel comes down, and, the, and then there's a startling act. I, I had to be a preacher. I'm sorry, y'all. You know, these are just points. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now, what this has to deal with is you remember back in chapter 5, and in chapter 5, God said to... Uh, uh, God said to, to heaven, up in heaven, they were all around this uh, scene, and, the, and God said, all right, who's worthy to open the scroll? You remember this? And, it, and John started crying because nobody in heaven, nobody on earth, nobody under the earth, nobody in the sea, no one was found who was worthy to open the book. Now, it didn't say who would be willing to open the book because Hitler would be willing to open the book. Napoleon would be able, willing to open the book. Uh, there might be a lot of crazy. Genghis Khan would probably be willing to open the book, but it didn't say who's willing. It said who's worthy. And there was only one, and it was the Lamb of God. And he stepped forward, and the Lamb of God, everybody say Jesus Christ, in heaven was made found worthy. Well, now that happened in heaven, but now the scene has shifted to earth. And John said, I'm standing on the earth, and I saw this giant angel come down, and it was dressed, and the sun looked like that. And, I, and then that angel put one foot on the land and one foot on the sea and was standing there like a gigantic statue for God. And so... The Lamb of God in heaven was worthy to open the book. Now he's got a scroll in his hand. And so what was, what was done in heaven is now going to be done, acted out on earth. Earth's going to get to see who's in control because he put one, land, one foot on the sea, which means I own the sea, and one foot on the land, which means I own the land. And so whether you're communist, whether you're uh, socialist, whether you're democracy, or whatever you might be, buddy, God owns you. God controls you. His foot represents his authority. You remember in the wilderness, in the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses told the children of Israel, get out there and walk, and every place the sole of your foot touches, it belongs to you. So now God steps on Land and sea, saying, all right, it's all yours. It's all mine. And so that is the startling act that begins there. And then, and he cried with a loud voice. It's when a lion roars. It's deafening, uh, terrifying. Uh, I've never really heard this live. Have any of you in here heard a lion roar? I mean, like a real roar, Brian, you have? I mean, they say it's, it, it'll rattle your eye teeth. I mean, it is just... It's tremendously, and who's going to take anything of a roaring lion? And when he cried out, look at this weird little thing, this startling act. Uh, and when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write down, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders utter, and do not write them down. All right? Now, a couple of thoughts here. One is, Jesus sets his feet on, on, on the land, or the big angel, in representing God and sent by Jesus to, to represent him, puts a, 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 a foot on the land and a foot on the sea and says, this is mine, and claims it. And then there's something in the background that starts rumbling, like, like thunder, some voices. And most people, when they read that, they think, okay, these thunders represent something in heaven saying something, that, that God doesn't want us to know about. So it's like, well, what would those thunders be saying? Maybe those thunders would start saying, boy, you're going to get it now. And they start revealing something that God's going to reveal in the future. And God doesn't want it said now. He, he doesn't want us to know it now because it's going to be, it's going to be, it's not for now. It's for even the future book. The book of Revelation is going to tell you what they said, but, uh, you know, but, but it's not going to be revealed at this moment. Now, that's because most people think of these thunders as being godly, something in heaven rumbling. Uh, what if they're not godly? What if these rumblings are rumblings from Satan? When God said, it's mine, 
and he claims the earth. What if the rumblings are, uh, no, it's not. No, oh, you, you wait. I'm going to get you, and I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what if it? What if those those rumblings are the voice of Satan saying, "I'm going to take it away. You're not going to get it. I'll get you." You know, like the old witch and wizard. Right? I'll get you, my pretty. And, and you know, and uh, and so God says to to John. Don't waste your ink writing that mess down. Don't waste your time writing that because he whipped. He can't do anything. You don't need to write what he said. Nobody needs to know that junk. Forget it. Go on. Let's go on, John. And so, and so uh, the, the startling act was, you know, Jesus lays claim to everything, and then all of a sudden Satan has his little word, and God said, don't write it down. Now, a stirring announcement is the next little, little thing that happens in verse 5. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven. All right, so here's the angel, and the angel standing down here representing Christ, representing the kingdom of God, and he begins to hold up his hand, and he's going to do something that Jesus told us not to do. How many of you are aware Jesus told us, don't swear? Do you know this? He says, don't swear by heaven and don't swear by the angels and don't swear by anything because they don't belong to you and you have no control over them. So don't do this. But now, an angel representing him does what he tells us not to do. Why? Because this booger does have the authority of heaven with him. He can do all of these things. These do belong to him. And so he can swear by these things because he has control over these things. And he raised his hand up to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever. Everybody say, God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the mystery, you know, the mystery of godliness. Yeah, how can three be one? But he is who created heaven. Everybody say, that's Jesus. I know you're saying, well, I thought God did. No, remember in the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then a couple of verses, it says, and all things were created by him, and with not, without him not, was nothing made that was made. So here we go, and swore, created heaven and the things that are in the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it, but that there should be delay no longer. So he, he lifts his hand, he, he says to the world, I'm going to swear before God and everything that is right and righteous that we're about to stop giving time for anybody to do anything, and we're moving forward, and judgment is quickly ready to come. There won't be delay anymore on this earth. And so that's the announcement that he makes. And But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished and declared as declared to his servants, the prophets. So he said, all right, we're going to quit playing around. We're going to blow this horn. And when the seventh trumpet blows, buddy, a big time starts. And we're not going to delay any longer. Uh, gr any opportunity for you to be saved is over with. And now you're going to just fall into destruction, just like I told the prophets. If you want to know what the mystery of God is, as he displayed to the prophets, the mystery of God is, if God's so strong, why doesn't he kill the devil? If God's so powerful, why does the devil, why did he leave him alive? Why does he let him tempt us? Why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? That's a mystery, right? Many of us are asking that question right now. God, how could you let this happen? And so the mystery is settled in that, God, when are you going to do this? We know the devil gets his comeuppance, but when is this going to happen? And so, and so God is revealing to us there will come a day when God's going to finally kill the devil, God's going to finally destroy him, and God's going to judge him, and, 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 and righteousness will rise, to, and, judge, and, and the evil will fall. And so that's the mystery of God. The mystery is, you know, God, why hadn't you done something already? And God said, here's the revelation. I'm going to do it. reason I hadn't done it right now, it's not time yet. reason I don't do it right now is uh, I'm still using him. I still need him to do whatever the purpose is so that my people can have a choice to love me or not love me so that I don't overwhelm you and you have no other choice. And so it's coming to an end and God tells us, all right, you know, there, that, that's just one of those things that are going to happen and, and that's, uh, that's, that's, what's, do, that's what's happening right now. Let me give you this. All right. 
All right, I'm going to have to click back. I'm sorry, guys. You getting this? I mean, is this making sense to you? All right, now, here comes a strange assignment. And by that, you'll see in just a second, something weird happens right here. Look at what he says. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I want you to know that the scroll is already opened, which means that, that, that it's visible, but it's not the, it's not the double-sided scroll with the seals on it because it says this little book was open. It was already open, so most likely it's a book that has some judgments in it written on it. This angel is carrying not the, set, not the sealed scroll that only the Lamb which is in heaven has the right to break the seals and open, which is written on the back side and the front side. That's a big scroll. It says this one was a little scroll. So it probably has some of what the prophet said about judgment and righteousness. It probably contained the law and some of those kind of things. And the angel already had it open. So it's not opened in heaven like the last one was. It's already open, and it's a tiny little thing, like, a, like everybody say, mini scroll. <laughs> it's a mini scroll. All right, then the voice which I heard in heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little scroll. So here goes John up to this big angel with the rainbow and the sun and, you know, and the fiery legs and feet. And I mean, here goes John, you know. <laughs> you know, this is just a point to think about. Isn't it interesting how John has changed? By that I mean, you remember the first time, uh, in, uh, the first time G John saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, what, what, what the Bible says, and I fell at his feet like a dead man. In other words, when John, the first time John saw Jesus, it was like, Ew. and Jesus had to pick him up and says, fear not. And do you know from that moment, he hadn't feared a single thing, has he? He's just walked into these thunderings and lightnings and bolts and lambs and angels flying around and cherubim everywhere and thrones and kingdoms and dominion. And he hadn't, he hadn't fallen out a single time since then. And now he sees this and, and an angel says, go, I mean, uh, God says, all right, go ask that angel for that book. Weird, isn't it? Go ask him for the book. And so here goes John. No, he's probably timid, but I mean, he's not, he was going to do it. And he, and he walks over and he said, uh, sir, can I please have that book? Don't ask me why. And, and then the angel, look, so I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little scroll. And he said to me, all right, here it is. Take it and eat it. And, in your, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Good night. What is it? And then I took the little scroll out of the angel's hand, and, and I ate it. I mean, you talk about ingesting the Word of God. You talk, you're talking about being filled with the Word of God. I mean, I, I've never wanted to eat my Bible. I don't know about you guys. But he did, and so this is just, he gets filled with the Word. I mean, that's the only thing that could be. I, I, I hate to tell you, you know, it's not really all that mysterious. Uh, and I took the little scroll out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and you know what? It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. In other words, look, hearing the fact that evil people are going to get their comeuppance makes us happy. It does me. I'm happy when bad people get, get what they deserve. And I pray for bad people to get what they deserve. Don't you? I mean, they don't deserve to be blessed. They don't deserve to have what they have. They don't appreciate it. They don't, they don't honor God for it. They're fat, happy, and sassy, living like a king somewhere. And I'm poor and broke and miserable, loving God down here, asking Jesus to help me make it another day. And don't tell me and look so spiritual at me like you don't pray for justice to be manifested on this earth. Now, you might not pray, God, give them a stroke, pour hot grease on them, or, you know, make them have a heart attack. But you, but, but you do say, Lord, there's got to be a justice in this world. 
So, when, look, when we hear about the fact that they're going to get it, at first, it's sweet to us. It's pleasant to us. We like hearing that. But then, when, as it goes along and we swallow and it gets in our stomach, and then we start realizing what that means, that some of the people we love are going to be punished and destroyed, that people we work with, people that live beside us, people in our own families who don't know Christ, who does, don't come to the Lord, that they're going to be the very ones that fall under this, this judgment and wrath. And, and, and then all of a sudden the realization makes our stomach sour. So at first it's sweet. But when you really think about what that really means, oh my goodness, it turns sour in your stomach. And so John, I don't know what was on John's mind. I don't know if it, that made him get discouraged. I don't know if, that, if, he, if he was thinking my ministry is doing nothing and I don't even know what this is about and this is the craziest thing I've done and nobody's going to care about all this. But God knew what he was thinking because look at the next verse. The next verse is, and he said to me, you must prophesy again. So John had to be thinking about not prophesying again, Right? I mean, what, what would he say that to him if, if he didn't know John's mind was thinking, i got to get out of here. This is overwhelming me. This is crazy. I don't even know what I'm looking at. And God says, hey, brother, you can't quit. I'm not letting you quit. And he says, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. He said, brother, we're not, the story's not over. You can't quit. Chuck up, pal. Put on your big boy britches and let's go because business is about to pick up. And so we have the big, scroll, uh, the big angel and the, and the little scroll. Now in the second in intermission in chapter 11, we get Jehovah. Are you guys okay? Are we making it all right? I'm not going so fast that you're going, I don't understand this, right? All right, here we go. Jehovah's true witnesses. Well, I, you know, I know we have some on this earth, but that's not, you know. These are the real things, all right? First thing is talked about is a special place. I mean, the place where these guys are called to, the place where they're ministered. It's a special place, and I'll show you. And this is where it gets real symbolic, but I'll try to help us through it real quick. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. Everybody think yardstick. It's a reed that is cut off to a certain length to have a certain measurement, like one meter or something like that. And so think a yardstick. So God gives him a yardstick, and John, remember John's on the earth, and he says, all right, that temple that's right in front of you, which means the temple in Jerusalem has to be already rebuilt by this time. The temple is not there now. The mosque of Omar is there, an Arab temple, a Muslim temple. So what does that mean? It means that the Antichrist has already given the Jews the site of the of the mosque of Omar and they've destroyed and crumbled the mosque of Omar and they've rebuilt Solomon's temple on the very spot that Solomon's temple stood all through the decades until Babylon destroyed it and, and so forth and Solomon's temple you know was built and you know the you know the story of all that but uh, back in Zechariah Zechariah says all right, we're going to have two olive trees, and we're going to have a lamp stand. It's going to be standing by. In other words, Zechariah saw in advance that this is what's going to happen, and so forth. And so uh, the, the, John says, hey, those guys that Zechariah talked about, these are them. Two olive trees. Olive has olive oil. Oil fills the lamps that make the light, lamps bright and shine, and the lamp stand is what gives light to everything. So he's talking about, okay, these guys are filled with the oil of God. Everybody say, Holy Spirit. The oil is re representative of the Holy Spirit. They poured it on the, on the priest, and they anointed the priest with oil, and the oil represented the power of God. And the little baby priest or the little, little uh, apprentice priest would get down at the priest's robe where the, the anointing oil was dripping off, and they'd be, they'd be putting that oil on their hand like that and putting it on themselves uh, to try to get some of the anointing that came off the high priest as it dripped off. Because they didn't put a little dot like you get when you're down here. They poured the whole thing, and it just ran down, ran down, ran down, and dripped off the bottom of his robe. 
So what this is saying is these two witnesses are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. These witnesses are going to shine bright in a dark world. No, Everybody's going to know these guys are from God and they're for real. Now, they're going to hate them worse for that, but they're going to know what happens. And if anyone wants, look at these, look at what he gave them. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouths and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut up heaven like, Eli like, like Elijah did. You remember in the Old Testament? Days of Ahab and Jezebel in the, in the temple, and they called down fire. You know, they, he said, all right, you call down fire, and, and, and they couldn't get any fire. And then Elijah says, get out of the way. Your service time is over. And he stepped in there, and he said, raised his hand to God, said about 31 words in the English language, and fire fell out of heaven and consumed the altar. And there was a drought for three and a half years because Ahab, I mean, Elijah walked into Ahab the king and said, Hey, king, ain't, no, ain't gonna rain till I say so. Now, you gotta be filled with the power of God to walk in and say to the king, It ain't gonna rain till I say so. And you know what? For three and a half years, it didn't rain because Elijah said so. So like Elijah, they're going to be given the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. Moses had that power, you remember? One of the plagues of Israel, he, he would touch that water with the rod and it turned to blood. Well, the magicians could do that too. You remember that. But he could touch it again and it would come back and they couldn't touch it again and do anything. Fake power. But uh, Moses did that. And to strike the earth with all plagues, Moses did that too. Remember the ten plagues? One of them was uh, a cattle disease that killed all the cattle, you know, anthrax or something. And then, and then the, the boils started coming on people's bodies, and the boils were all over their bodies, you know, chemical warfare. Chemi I mean, I can't even imagine what kind of biological things and bacterial things and viral things could be perpetrated on people by the time this happens, all the evil weapons and evil things. But they're going to have that power. So if you approach these guys... You better be ready because first thing that's going to happen is fire is going to and poof, you turn into a crispy critter right there on the spot. Change your stroke or go up and slow. And they do this, it says, as often as they desire. So that's why everybody hates them. They are a plague on this earth. They are, they are detested by this earth because this earth can't touch them. They can't kill them. They can't. God has protected them. And just like John the Baptist was immortal until he had fulfilled his purpose, when John the Baptist fulfilled his purpose, they threw him in jail. And then Herodias, the little maiden, danced at the banquet of her, of her, of her daddy. Or it might have been granddad. I read the story in a while. But he, she danced at the banquet, and she pleased the king. And the king said, what you want up to half the kingdom? And, and, and her old evil family whispered to her, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And she said, can I have the head of John the Baptist on a platter? And they went down to prison, cut John's head off, brought it on a platter, and gave it to her. He was dead. But until he, he was finished making straight the paths of the Lord, when, he had, when Jesus stepped out and started ministering, there was no more need for John the Baptist. Because his message wasn't come to Christ and be saved. His message was repent, you wicked infidel, and get your heart ready to receive something great. And when he, God was finished, boom, he could be killed. And he was killed. Same way with these two witnesses. These two witnesses are immortal until God is finished with them. And they will be killed by the beast. And if you, uh, uh, let's see, let me go on. So the martyrdom of the messengers. When they finish their testimony, that's what I was talking about, when God's finished with them, the beast that ascends, now notice, now he was the beast that came out of the sea to start with. But now notice, he ascends out of the bottomless pit now. Now, there is a difference in that. Let me just hastily tell you what it is. And you'll, we'll, we'll see more about this. All right. Somewhere in, in tribulation, 
Now follow me, and I, this may sound bizarre, but, it, but it's, you'll see it, and it's really real. Somewhere in tribulation, all right, this, the, the beast is a human being. The guy that's going to be the Antichrist is probably on this earth right now. He, he may have been born in the 60s or whenever, and he's growing up. And he's going to be ready when, when this happens. He's going to be a human being. He's the beast that came out of the sea the first time we see him. Now he's the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, which means something has happened to him. He's no longer a human. He's been filled with Satan. He has... He has transformed, and now not to throw a cog in your thinking, but just to show you, in chapter 13 of Revelation, we're going to meet a beast, and this beast has seven heads and ten crowns and ten horns, and one of his heads is going to be killed and miraculously be, be healed. And that's going to be a powerful witness to the world, and they're going to say, Good night! The beast has power to heal himself. He must be our Messiah. He must be our king. And, they're gonna, and that's going to make them believe in him more because he had this terrible head wound, and it's not John Kennedy, so hang that up. <laughs> he had this terrible head wound, but he healed himself, and that, and that just makes them want him more. So what I'm saying to you is that most likely what happens, the messengers kill him. And then... When he gets resurrected and it's time for the ministry of the messengers to be over, God allows them to be killed, and so he comes back now and kills them. So that just ingratiates him more to the world because they despise these suckers. And the fact that he killed them is a plus, 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 plus. He's got to be the Messiah. Nobody's been able to touch those guys, man. I mean, they're immortal. They're powerful. Nobody even gets close to them. But our old Messiah, hey, the beast is the Messiah. The beast is the Messiah. The he came back to life, and then he killed those two abominable witnesses that's been torturing us for the first three and a half years. <laughs> so this is just this shows you how the world goes. When they finish their testimony... The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, this demon energized, this satanic demon-filled beast, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies, listen, look at how perverted this world is. I'm not so sure that right now, if certain people would be killed, and their bodies could be taken and laid out on the street, and everybody come up there and spit on them and stomp on them, and, 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 and some of these uh, networks would cover it, and everybody would be jubilating and happy and all that like a bunch of demons. I'm not so sure that wouldn't happen right now. But it's certainly going to happen here. Look at what happened. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the, of, of the great city. Jerusalem is called the great city. Why? Because it was the city of righteousness at, up until the witnesses were dead. It was the city where the, where the two witnesses ministered uh, the gospel and tried to get people saved and come to the Lord. So Jerusalem, as long as the witnesses were alive, was a great city. But look at what it becomes. Now it spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom is the seat of vice wickedness, sexual immorality, impurity, fire fell from heaven because Sodom was, was full of demonism and homosexuality and wickedness and evil and perverts and men and daughters. I mean, not, not, just, not just homosexual sin, but all kind of sexual sin. Vice. And Egypt, great pride. Why wouldn't Pharaoh let the Jews go? Because he was so proud. So we got vice and vanity, and then he says, uh, uh, where also our Lord was crucified, which now the great city, uh-uh, spiritual city, uh-uh, righteous city, uh-uh, witness is dead. Now that city has become full of vice, full of vanity, and full of violence. So everything's changed in the city because now the witnesses are gone their bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. Worldwide notice goes out, come dance on the body. And people come in from all over the world, CNN, got the cameras going. I mean, you know, it's just unbelievable. And notice this, this is crazy. And those 
from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put in the grave. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. In other words, Christmas turns into a uh, happy kill the prophets day. And they give Christmas, they don't give Christmas gifts, they give uh, kill the two prophets gifts. They're gleeful, joyful, the demons. Because these two guys represent righteousness and good and holiness and everything, and they hadn't been able to do anything, and now the beast has killed them. Let's have a party. But something happens right in the middle of all this. I'm just about finished, y'all. Hang on, I promise you. I know if, if you're hanging on, you, you're good. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. I mean, here they are dancing on a jig around them, got their gifts out. Got, you got a pretty sweater. You got a little Tonka toy. You got everything, boy. And they dance around. They're happy, uh, drinking. You know, they got their little hats on with the baubles and all that stuff. There's a dead body laying there that's corpse colored, life stiff now. And all of a sudden, pink starts flowing down into the skin. And those, those limbs that are, that are uh, you know, uh, in rigor mortis. Uh, come, come unrigored and unmortised. <laughs> and those bodies start moving, and it's like, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, now they're scared. Because now, now it's like, watch that mouth, it's full of fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, the cameras are rolling, and it's big time, world news. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Got raptured right there in front of them. Bless God. A lot of people say, who are these witnesses? Don't have time to go deep into it, but I will give you an opinion. The Bible says in Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. What does that mean? It means every one of you are going to die. One time. One time then you're going to go to judgment. The judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne, one or the other. It's your, it's your choice. So if that is absolute truth, if that's the absolute final word, on the, and we don't know anything else about it, but that's the absolute final word, that's what the Bible says about mankind. We die once, and then we go to the judgment. These two witnesses can only be two people because there are only two people that have ever left this earth without dying. One of them is Elijah. He got caught up in a chariot of fire. Pfft, remember that? Didn't die. He just got lifted off the earth and a chariot of fire went to heaven. And then Enoch, who was old man Enoch, and he says, and Enoch walked with God and was not. Now, you don't know much about Enoch. You say, man, that, I don't, Enoch, that's kind of underwhelming. Well, that's because you don't know anything about Enoch. Enoch wrote a book, the book of Enoch. And it didn't make it into the canon of the Scripture, but, but it was used by early churches. I mean, it was considered true and real because Enoch wrote it and all that. And you can go on the Internet, type in the book of Enoch, and you can read what Enoch had to say. Enoch was a great prophet of God and a man of God. I mean, why do you think he was walking, an old man Enoch walking down the road, and all of a sudden, pfft, gone? Now, those are the only people on, that have ever lived that have not died once. So, there you go. Has to be them. I mean... Now, you know, whether it's really them like they're that old and look out like that, I don't know. Or whether it's just their spirit that inhabits, you know, somebody that looks contemporary and all. <coughs> but that's, that's the spirit and that's who they, they were. And the enemy saw him go up in the cloud. And in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Uh, reluctantly gave glory to the God of heaven because they knew, boy, I mean, whenever you come back to life after three and a half days and go to heaven, get sucked up into heaven, <coughs> there has to be a God. The seventh trumpet sounds, the second woe is passed. Behold, the third woe is coming. The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. How many of you have ever heard the Messiah? You, those words are familiar, right? Yeah. That's because Handel took the words from right there. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever, forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it. 
That's what the angels started singing. Boy, that was a praise party in heaven. And the 24 elders, you didn't wonder what they were doing, who sat before God on their thrones and fell on their faces and worshiped God, uh, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. The old raggedy demon dragon beast is the one who was and, and, and who is not and the one who yet is. He's, a, he's an imitation. One who is, was, one who is to come because you have taken your great power and you have reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come at the time of the dead and they shall be judged that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there were lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. This right here is the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant was a piece of furniture in the tabernacle that was in the holy of holies. That on the top, that top is three and a half inches of solid gold. Those cherubim are solid gold. Their wings almost touch right in the middle. That was where the blood, right at that little gap, that's where the blood was applied by the high priest once a year for all the sins of Israel called the Day of Atonement. And, and he would drop that blood right where those wings come together. And that's the mercy seat of God. And that went with Israel. It went out in front of Israel, about, about 800 meters in front of everybody. It led the children of Israel. It was the power of God. The, the, the Philistines tried to get it, and 20,000 of them died just right there for even looking at it. I mean, this was a powerful dude. It was covered with blue skins and other skins while they carried it because nobody could even look at it. It was so holy. Only the priest could go in, and he couldn't just go in when he wanted to, only one time a year. This thing had three things in it. It had the, the Ten Commandments that when Moses threw them down, it broke into pieces. They took the Ten Commandments, and they, and they put it in there. Why? Because Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of the law. They took the pot full of manna, representing when God fed the people with manna, because Jesus is the real bread of life. And then they took Aaron's rod that budded, it was an almond stick, and it proved that Aaron was the high priest because it was a dead walking stick, and he put it down, and, it, and, and buds came out and flowers came out. It was an almond. Almonds are the first trees that bud first ahead of anything else because you're, Jesus is the resurrection of life. That's what the ark had in it. And the Bible says that whenever... Whenever we went to heaven or whenever they call, the witnesses called heaven, all of a sudden the temple opened up in heaven and the ark was revealed. Which means the way has been opened. No more distance between us and God. Chapter 10 and 11. There you go. All right, stand up.